Hello everyone, and welcome back to the Vast Anonymous Comedy Vault. I'm Captain Logan. And I'm Eric. Today, Eric and I have some solo things to chat about. Uh, I have some uh, recommendations. Eric, and so I'm going Not to reviews, do... just recommendations. Just recommendations. No, things that people recommended for me to oh, review. Oh, okay. Requests, if you will. The first one comes from Ian McKee, who had me review a few months ago Batman Murderer, which I really didn't care for. I thought it was too long. I thought it was really meandery. And, of course... I'm complaining about a collection, right? Like, I'm complaining about a thing that I could have taken a bunch of stories out of and might have liked a little bit better. But even if you took all the, like, interlude stories and intermediate stuff out, it still didn't get enough done before we get to Fugitive. And now that I've read Fugitive, which is quite a bit better, I, don't, I still don't love it. I think both of these things together as a big event were hyped up too much and treated like another Nightfall in No Man's Land. They're not it, They're not to that caliber, and the premise of it, and what we do with the premise, just never really gets to the epicness of those things as you would kind of expect it to. Now, if you did a really compelling, more low-key, uh, like, like, personal, inner conflict kind of story for Batman, like, everybody thinks I'm a murderer, what do I do with that? Um... And and I just thought that the personal stakes were high enough for Batman. I could be totally fine with the fact that it's not a big epic thing. It needs to feel epic in scope, though, at least for Batman. And it never quite achieves that. I, I think the best stuff in this is kind of like the best stuff in the first... In, in the in in the the, the lead in because mm -hmm. I do look at murder as a lead in I think you can completely skip it I think you should just look at this and forget forget murder like and, and, and no man's land I was gonna say it is that's where I was going with all this you stole my thunder Eric you stole my my earthquake uh yeah it's it's cataclysm all over again um except that cataclysm is like six issues isn't it ex no it's it's a lot more than that is it really um, yeah okay. I, I mean I've got the big hefty trade for it it's oh, it's got to be right. more than six there's a hefty yeah, yeah. trade. I was thinking small story. But Cataclysm, very quickly, you can you can tell what it's just a disaster story. It's just, here's a bunch of people's different situations. You know, like if you did a zombie apocalypse thing. Like, here's all these different people who, de who deal with the Cataclysm, and uh, it, it, it doesn't treat itself like an event in the same way, mm -hmm. but these do... And so, but anyway, I think the best stuff in both this and Murderer all are the kind of smaller... Uh, stories and like and like more personal things um in the midst of this as a grand ambitious project it kind of falls flat for me ultimately does it feel like it could have just been a story um, in a batman book it really does and like premise i know i'm complaining about the premise a lot i was hoping that it would pay off in a way that would be more satisfying so i wouldn't still be saying this it feels like an episode of television to me it's like well this is the one where uh, Bruce Wayne gets framed for a murder. I mean, we, we do that kind of thing. So, like, Nightfall was a real original thing. You can't, like, pin that down entirely to, like, one stereotypical, you know, kind of quintessential premise, right? Mm -hmm. Like, like okay, the, the uh, like, the, the, like, big scary foil for the villain is there, and the, uh, like, uh you know, crippled hero is there. But, like, it's a lot of things, right? Mm -hmm. And No Man's Land is the same way. Um, this just doesn't have that. At the end of the day, it still is just the the hero gets uh, gets framed for murder. Mm -hmm. uh, and, like, yeah, it's not just some random person who gets murdered. It's a girlfriend he's had there for a while, and you're supposed to care about her. But, I mean, some of the problem, of course, is that I was not reading this before that. I didn't know who Vesper Fairchild was before I read these. Um, but... When you read the uh, the afterword by uh, I think Greg Rucka wrote one and uh, there's maybe even another one, um, but Greg Rucka, yeah, Brubaker Br 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 did one. Oh, they too. both did. They both did one. Yeah. Wow. Um, but yeah, they're making uh, especially Rucka. They're making a big deal out of how the the initial idea for this was 
what, and I feel like I'm reading between the lines a little bit, and they're not, this is not the thing they're most proud of working on either, but... Rock um, has basically said he disowns this. That he has not it. just this, but like there's a there's a line on his Batman run, everything after it, he's basically disowned. Wow. And this is, falls on that He line. loves to decanonicize it. Um, Rucka talks about how the idea here was, let's like shake the foundation for Batman and make him like really question who he is and why he does what he does. And I'm like, yeah, okay, but we do that a lot. It's not mm. like a new idea or anything. Mm. And uh, the best stuff in this is about the identity issues for Batman, which, of course, we do tackle a lot, but Brubaker especially does some really interesting things with it. So um, my favorite story in this, I think, is right toward the beginning, where uh, Bruce Wayne is... Uh, kind of going back to the murder of his parents and dissecting it and dissecting how he feels about it. And uh, there's a there's a cop that dealt with him when he was a kid who's uh, asking him, like on his deathbed, to uh, solve the murder of Bruce Wayne's parents. And you think that's maybe going to be like a story where he's going to go do that. He doesn't actually end up doing that. Mm -hmm. but it's a really cool idea. And then, and I, I wish we had run with that, but then I don't know if maybe like Batman secretly already knows the answer to that, but just publicly... It, in this continuity, I honestly don't know that. I don't know if Joe Chill was ever captured, or, like, I don't I don't know about, I don't know about any of that. Joe Chill goes back and forth, because cause, uh, uh, sometimes, like, like at least Snyder uses it, like, um, it's, a, it's, it's like a, it's like a, Joe Chill's not a man, it's a, oh. like a John Doe. Yeah. Joe's Joe Chill. Okay. Um, but other times, like, year two, he's very specifically... A man named Joe Chill. I Morrison does that too. I think it just goes back and forth. It begins, does it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I but I think it goes back and forth. I think it sometimes I'm kind of I think sometimes it depends on the writer. But anyway, so um, but that idea has him like thinking about it again, and uh, he goes through this whole uh kind of you know um kind of kind of inner journey where he's uh, where, where he comes to realize that he and and you would like this because this is very much your batman he starts from the i'm um, batman and not bruce wayne place and he ends up in the uh no wait it's not just my parents murder that defines me it's the ideals that i got from my father mm -hmm. like that stuff matters so so like so like i i am I am actually Bruce Wayne, and Batman is part of me, but I didn't just throw away Bruce Wayne. I thought I did that, but I didn't. Mm -hmm. And he kind of finds himself a little bit again. Mm -hmm. um, and so I like that, I like, like encapsulated that way, but it doesn't really do a lot for the grander narrative. Like, when he discovers that, he's still going through the same motions he's been going through before, which is, I'm going to put the Bruce Wayne persona away because everybody thinks I murdered Vesper Fairchild and I'm on the run and so the best way to hide is just to be Batman, which that makes sense practically, but it seems like in his head, there are places where it seems like we forgot where we got to with that Brubaker story, mm -hmm. um, where he's like, he, he still continues to insist that when he does speak with the Bat family, which he does rarely because he's doing that loner Batman, I don't want anybody to talk to me thing, I'm going to handle this all by, by myself. Has to 15, and that, 15 sidekicks. And that always goes so well for Batman. Yep. He never learns from this, ever. Yep. Yep. Um, it, like, like, we still constantly tell this story. Death of the family is that story. And he... Well, you'd think at this point he might have learned from that a little bit. And I'll get to the villain motivation uh, in a little bit with who actually killed Vesper Fairchild, because the whole thing is about Batman realizing that he needs his friends, and it's just too easy and tacked on, and I don't like it. Uh, That's really funny. It, yeah, it's not, it's not great. It's a little CW. Um, but, I don't say that a lot, but it is. It's a little CW. So, Batman is, after that Brubaker story, and not too far after that, uh, he is insisting that when he does have to deal with the Bat family, they not call him Bruce. Like, I'm not Bruce. But you just did a story about how you are Bruce. So, like, why are you still doing that? And it seems like, I, honestly, I'm not, and I some of this, because I read this a while ago and I had to go back to some of it, so some of this I've looked at twice now, and I'm not 100% sure why he feels the need to keep letting the Bat family think that he might have actually done the murder. Like, they're pretty sure he didn't, but there's a little bit of this, well, we don't have a better explanation, and it, it's a thing he could do. Like, I like I like some of the Nightwing and Oracle 
uh, and Batgirl like investigating that night and constantly going through it and figuring out all the perm permutations, no matter how crazy and convoluted they might be, of like, well, this is a thing Bruce Wayne could have done. And then Batgirl especially, Cassandra Cain we're talking about, she's wonderful in this. Um, Cassandra Cain is, is uh, every time somebody says, like, well, Batman could have done this, she winces. You know, she's like, uh, she's like, you know, oh my God, we can't be thinking that way. And Nightwing's like, no, we don't actually think he did it, but we have to. We're trying to disprove for sure that it was mm. him. So we have to go through the things that we're, we're you know, you know, it could have been him that did it. And the reason Bat Batgirl's there in front and center is kind of, uh, I think, intentional foreshadowing because we're going to find out that the person who actually killed Vesper Fairchild was Kanan, was her father. And so we have her uh, involved in the investigation in the first place and feeling awful about the idea that, that maybe Batman could have done this, even though I can't imagine him doing that. And then it turns out that it, it's her father. And it seems like we just have to make up uh, like some kind of explanation for why in the world he would agree to do this, because he's hired to do this, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but... His motivation, he's like, I wasn't even going to take the contract. He's an assassin. And he's like, I wasn't even going to take the contract until I found out who it was. And Batman's like, uh, like, like, look, I thought you kind of came to terms with the fact that your daughter is not with you anymore and stuff. And he's like, well, it's not about that. It's like, like, I, like, like, I, I have accepted the fact that she's not going to stay with me anymore. Um, the reason I'm after you is because I don't think you deserve to have her with you because uh, you're a monster like me. And he wants to, like, mm. prove that uh, by trying to get him to turn against his uh, against uh, his surrogates, against his family. Um, and he thinks that going through with that and murdering Vesper Fairchild, he's going to go off on it. He, like, he says, it's a, it's a test. I'm trying to test you and see if you're better than I thought you were, or you're better than me. Mm. But, like, you're not, because this is what you're doing. I think all that's a little silly. Okay. I don't... I don't love that. I didn't. I, I. I didn't buy it. That. That felt. That felt like retroactively. We need to come up with some kind of a motivation. Mm. And I didn't love that. Um, the. The person who hires him is Lex Luthor, President Lex, who uh, is still. And I don't know why he took this long, but he's still upset about things that happened during No Man's Land and Bruce constantly, like, standing up to him and trying to mess up his getting elected and constantly mm. trying to mess up his... Like, the, they say, like, for the last year and a half while he's been in office, um, Bruce has been uh, trying to, like, you know, uh, sully his name and make it clear, like, like who, who he really is. And Lex doesn't like that, and Lex isn't going to take that, you know, lying down. He takes it lying down for much longer than I would think Lex Luthor would. Um, and you could say, oh, well, he's Bruce Wayne, he's powerful. Like, maybe it's hard for him to, to get that close to him. But I don't buy that. I think he would have done this. No, I would just say, well, we weren't telling the story yet. How many, yeah, that's what it is. How many assassins are there? You know what I mean? Like, Deadshot shows up in this. Like, there's there's, there's, there's a big, like, Deadshot versus Kane fight at the end of this, and they have a personal thing that I don't care about. Um, there's a lot of that where I'm just like, and this is a subplot I'm not really caring about, and, uh, like, I don't really care that much about his about his his uh, bodyguard. You know about Sh Sasha Bordeaux, that whole thing? She's, I just, she's, she's, she's Rucka's, because Rucka has to introduce a strong female character in every book he writes. I just don't care about that whole thing. <laughs> I'll talk about that in a minute, briefly, because I don't care, but 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 she's she's got a couple major stories in that. Um, but anyway, so, uh, so Lex hires him, but, and I think this is, this might sound convoluted, I think this is kind of an interesting idea, it's not worth all the lead-up. I don't know why we couldn't have gotten all this at the end of Bruce Wayne murder. Part of the problem with this is the structure, right? This should open with, now we know who it is, let's deal with that. Like, uh, Bruce Wayne murderer gets nothing done. You get to the mm. end of that book, and we still don't know who did it, and we don't have any clues, we don't know anything. And all of that happens in the first, like, you know, three or four or five issues in this. Mm. We've already solved it halfway through this. The rest of it is aftermath. So, like, Murderer's too long. This is, in a way, kind of too short. Like, it's it's lengthy. And by the way, just looking at this trade, you wouldn't think it's as long as it is. This is, like, 400 pages. Um, but, like... DC has some kind of magic thing they've been doing lately. I, I'm sorry to say about the Aquaman trade. I, I don't know how they get like all that Which was, like, a thin trade. is eight issues. I got this in the mail, and I went, Oh, they sent me the wrong one. They sent me the old broken up ones. No, they didn't. This is all of it. This is all of it. They left nothing out. Uh, but anyway, so, like, we solve it in the middle. So you figure, okay, and, and when I say we solve it, I don't just mean that we know who did it. I mean, Bruce Wayne is cleared. 
halfway through, page like 200, 250, he's cleared. And it's really funny how he gets cleared too, because it's Kane just going like, where where uh, Batman or or uh, or Nightwing or someone is like is like, uh, uh, well you're you're gonna you're gonna fess up to this, and uh, they've captured him, and he's like, yeah, who cares now? So he just does. He's just like, whatever, fine. He does. And he gets thrown in prison, and then he's got like a death wish. He just doesn't care anymore. And I don't either. Like, if we killed him, then I wouldn't have to read about him at the end of this, because I just did not care. Um, and he's kind of interesting in No Man's Land, but, like, he, he's, he's not super interesting here. I'm sounding really down on this. This is way better than than, than Murder, but... But you, you kind of hated Murder. But I kind of hated Murder, yeah. Um, and so, like, I didn't even really care that much about the setup. So, with half of this book left, and we've already taken out Kane, we will get back to Kane, but it's just... Like dead shot after him in a prison, and then we just put him in another prison. So like you know, you know, it's it's not like a big showdown thing. Mm -hmm. What would you think we would do at the end of this? Just Bruce Wayne actually kill somebody? No, we just get tired and start <laughs> blow somebody away. No, knowing what we know, and then they, and then they hide it, and they're like, of course, because if Batman killed somebody, no one would ever know. Knowing what we know now about who hired him, you'd think there would be like some kind of a big showdown. Like yeah. Lex Luthor never appears. Never! He's not in this! Because <laughs> you were like, I can't wait to, for you to find out who it is! Because someone someone told me. He's just talked about off panel! Like, he never shows up! I think there might be, like, a panel with Mercy or something, but Lex never shows up! That's really funny. Um, like... I don't want to say that the character arc is completely over by the by, by the by the middle, by the halfway point, because... By halftime, because, um... Bruce Wayne is dealing with the consequences of his actions. This is a lot about how he manipulates people and uses people, and that's where uh, the Sasha Bordeaux thing comes in, where, like, um, this is... It's weird, because, like, we're really, we're really positive about Batman at the same time as we're a little bit cynical about Batman. So, like, so, like we have that wonderful thing that I told you about that Brubaker does where he discovers that he is the man he is because of his parents. Mm-hmm. But then we also say maybe the idea is just that like he's become really damaged, he's gotta come back from this. But then we do this whole thing where we try to explain why he he has so many sidekicks and why the sidekicks all figure out who he is. Mm -hmm. And the expl because we do this with Sasha, the explanation is he sets them up to find the Batcave or find something out about him. They don't figure it out on their own. Like he always intentionally sets them up to find out. That's weird with Tim. Yeah, it is. Well, they don't, they don't actually say that it is all that way, but it's implied. It's implied that that's what he usually does. And the idea is, he puts them, he, when he really cares about a person, he puts them in a costume to get them at arm's length so he can control them. And that's what he's always doing. And the reason he can't um, like rely on his family is because he doesn't actually, even though he cares about them, he doesn't really see them that way. He sees them as like players on a chessboard, and like he's got to control them. Yeah, I don't like this era of Batman. Where he's just the most manipulative, conniving, controlling. Like this is also Tower of Babel. I was gonna say this is when we do Tower of Babel. This is Tower yeah. of Babel, and this is uh, War Games, and uh -huh. War Games is absurd. The level. I'm still gonna read that. I haven't read this. I'm gonna I read that. I'm gonna hate it, but I'm gonna read that. I know War Games. When you find out what the premise of, well, not the premise, like what War Games is, uh -huh. Batman is the most controlling, insane, neurotic person ever. So real quick, the thing with Sasha is that, like. She... Not having read that, I hate that idea. That that's yeah. why ba Batman does that. I didn't love that either. She... And the idea is, like, now he's trying to, like, make amends for that and stuff. But it gets really kind of melodramatic and sappy with her. With with with, uh, with, with him and Sasha. Because the idea is, like, he fell in love with her. And, like, like he like he could tell that she was in love with him. And he, he was afraid he was falling for her. And so, like, he, again... Uh, like puts her in a costume and puts her puts her arm link, arms linked does that whole thing and that makes war games worse. Knowing that that's like two years after this, that that makes that he learned his lesson. He kept doing it. And I don't know. Oh my god. And I don't know if you know this, but he forgets he needs his friends. Like two years later, he's gonna forget he needs his friends. I don't, I don't know if you know this, but Sasha doesn't know. Um, doesn't actually personally know Alfred. Like they work totally separately. Like she's never in the manor. And oh, yeah, and I guess that makes sense. Which is yeah, which I didn't know. And uh, she anyway, so so like like uh, she kind of takes. They make a big deal out of like metaphorically, she takes the bullet for Bruce Wayne. Um, so she knows that he didn't murder Vesper Fairchild, but 
Um, she's not going to say what she knows about him because that might out him as Batman, and she gets uh, prosecuted for um, helping him in the murder. Mm -hmm. And uh, and there's this whole there's this whole thing uh, that the prosecution puts forth that like they're lovers and stuff, and they never actually did anything together, but apparently they were in love, whatever. And then she, uh, and then like like uh. While she's in prison, there's a guy that tries to get her to, you know, out Bruce Wayne, and and uh, and and she won't do that. And then uh, she ultimately ends up having her death faked by Checkmate, and then she becomes an agent of Checkmate, and she gets her she gets a different face. They do that whole thing. Like we're gonna cast a new actress, and I she gets a different she's face. She's Checkmate ones. I, I imagine she probably is, because she's still around at the end of this. Um, so you think she's dead for a minute, and then it turns out that she's not, and then when she and Bruce Wayne finally meet for the last time, uh, th there's that whole conversation about how he, uh, you know, controls people, and then, uh, he, like, while she's saying this, he tries to make out with her, and that's a weird moment, and then it's just this real soap opera, like, we can never see each other again thing, and then she leaves, and then you don't see her again, and yeah, um... It's not great. Uh, it's better than Murderer, but I don't know what the big hubbub was about. I remember this being everywhere. I remember this cover all over the place. I have a couple of, uh, of, of issues of this with kind of iconic covers. We made a big deal out of this. And I think a lot of it was just because of the uh, creators that worked on it. Because, I mean, it was like the No Man's Land dream team, a lot of it. Like, Greg Rucka's there, and Brubaker's there, and... Uh, Dennis O'Neill's there. Dennis O'Neill's there, yeah. Oh, and I didn't even talk about Asriel. The Asriel stuff's kind of fun. Uh, Asriel shows up, and he breaks into the Batcave, and he steals his old Asriel Batman suit, and he goes after Bruce Wayne, because um, he's on some kind of weird hallucinogenic something, rather, and he thinks that St. Numa is telling him to kill Bruce Wayne because Bruce Wayne murdered someone, and uh, we can't have that because that's bad, and that goes against the Order of St. Numa, and so, like, he's trying to kill him, but uh, he's, like, it's it's completely a he's-not-himself story, and, you know, he's under an influence, and it's, like, four issues of that, but the action in that's really good. Also, the art in this is all over the place, just like No Man's Land, mm -hmm. and I think that No Man's Land artist I don't like uh, with a really amorphous drawing is probably drawing this Kane issue at the end where he's fighting Deadshot, and it's just god-awful. Look at that. It's just like, oh, God, what are we looking at? Um... Um, I think I know... Wow, whoa, look at that Batman. Yeah, I know. It's rough. He kind of looks like, um... But I'm pretty sure that guy's in No Man's Land. Okay, he kind of looks like the artist that does, um... Nightwing for, like, for, like... Uh, for like oh, you're years. right! Yeah! Uh, I don't know about you, I don't like the, the artwork. I mean, I... If it's who I think it is, I've liked him in other places. Okay. Scott McHale! Yeah, I, I, I like his Nightwing stuff. Okay. I'm just gonna show the camera, but oh, yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. But yeah, this, this stuff's not great. Um, I know that name. Oh um, yeah, he's not in love with this. Arrow that I like. Okay, maybe he's on deadline or something. I don't know. It, it looks like he's on deadline. Yeah. Um, it looks like Deadshot has a gun to his head trying to draw this issue. Yeah, it does. But uh, anyway, yeah, uh, it's not good. I mean, it's not great. I don't hate it. Um, but I could not believe that we didn't have some kind of a showdown with Lex. I know he's the president, but something. When we, when you get there, and you're like, you have just well, there's half a book left. Surely. That's what I thought. Yep. So anyway, uh, but for 400 and something pages, it reads fast, so I'll give it that. That's good. That's good. Um, I was actually able to read that in one day, which is kind of surprising. Yeah, it's so long. Yeah. Anyway, uh, so Eric, why don't you go ahead and talk about the the, the uh, issues that you read of Stan Lee, Spider-Man, that I have read before, but not recently. Mm -hmm. uh, you read The Death of Captain Stacy. Which I actually have it in a separate trade. I have reviewed before, also. So you can't find a review of me talking about this. So Eric will talk about this. All right, so uh, the issues I'm doing are Death of Captain Stacy, which is, what did I say before, 80, 88 to 90? It's actually before the thing we reviewed earlier. Yeah, yeah. Well, I read it first. I did read it first. Um, I was like, I'm going to try to read these and see how quick I can get through these. I was like, oh, had I, you read them before? I don't think so. Death of Captain Stacy? I don't think so. I've definitely, I definitely read the re the drug issues. Like I have like vague, like reading those in the in the central volume. I don't think I read these. And number wise, how far after is Gwen Stacy? Because famously, Stanley always talks about how close together they were. I think it's like one forty or something. Oh, okay, it's not that close. No, like I think it's a couple of years real time. Okay, okay. I think, um, 
But, uh, so, the death of Captain Stacy is kind of like, I don't know, a bunch of other comics where, like, it's remembered for being the death of Captain Stacy and, like, it's very important. It's not really apparent until the last, like, three pages that, like, anything is happening. Really? Yeah, like... He dies right at the end? Yeah, so what happens... I don't remember this real well. Okay, I so the jump at the end... Um, Spider-Man sprays Doc Ock's arms with this, like, thing that, like, makes them, like, not respond. Like, they're just, like, going crazy and, like, attacking each other. And he hits a chimney. And then the pieces are falling. Oh, no, look out, that kid! And then they <laughs> oh, yeah! fall on Captain Stacy. Which, by the way, he's, like, crushed there, but later he's just gonna be, like... I guess Spider-Man gets him out. He, does he? Yeah, yeah, because... Yeah, he gets like, him out, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, like... He should be all bloody. I like the shot a lot. Yeah, it's a good one. It's a good one. Um, but, uh... So, yeah. Uh, it's about three pages. Not really that important. I just just move on. Uh, no, um, I had a real experience reading these. Um, I probably would have had this uh, more so with the drug issues if I'd read those first. But, like, I was like, oh, yeah, this is what comic books should be like. This is what comic books feel like. This is how they're paced. This is... Like, if I picture a comic book, it's this. Like, I think think if I handed these issues to a kid, it'd be... Like, yes, this is what a comic book is. Um, So Dr. Octopus uh, has apparently been spending all the time since last we saw him, whatever that was, uh, working on his mental concentration because Dr. Octopus is mentally connected to his robot arms. So they're kept in New York, but he's kept, like, in, in the Midwest somewhere, and he's just been... He's just been just thinking real hard, and his arms bust this out. This is coming back to me a little bit. His arms bust out. They go all the way over to where he is. I remember that being hilarious. And then, and then... They just go across country like Psygorm. Yep, yep. Um, and they go across country in no time, but it takes Doc Ock forever, because he has to, like, steal a... Uh, steal uh, He has to uh, steal a plane. And the plane that he steals... Uh, just so happens to have, uh, what's this guy's name? Because a bunch of picketers about him. Um, he's a stand-in for some real-world figure. I'm not sure. Um, no <laughs> picketers. Just looking for those picketers with those signs. I think his name's Sue. S-U. He's so. Is Rorschach there? Is he like the in the thing? This is one of the. It's you. Oh. Uh, it, uh, it's, it's something you. Um, why, why you, oh no, one of these is Miss, oh, okay, Sue needs you, it is Sue, okay. Sue needs you, okay. but the you is spelled why you, I guess they're doing something with that, very clever, Picketers, very, very clever, oh, signs like um, it, yeah. uh, so anyways, uh, I assume that this was dealing with something topical at the time, <laughs> so there's some kind of, there's some kind of Asian but you weren't there. You were you were not alive yet. I so was you not just alive. Even know. Hey, this is why you shouldn't be doing stuff like this. It dates immediately, and no one knows what's happening. Um, He's kidding. He uh, he might be kidding. I don't know. Uh, so, so 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 it's like this foreign dictator, this like this like Asian dictator. Um, I assume this is some. Well, this is after Vietnam, right? Yeah. Sixty eight, sixty nine. Right around there, then. Yeah. Okay, we're dealing with something. We're dealing with something, but. Dr. Octopus goes and steals well, his Vietnam point. ends in, what, 73? Because, cause, uh... Is it that late? Because, like, Days of Future Past is making a big deal out of we're just at the end of it. I guess you're we right. We just finished it. That's in 73. Right. Okay. I, I, know, I know all my real-world history dates because of X-Men movies, apparently. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 yeah. Um, so, so, I, so they, uh... Dr. Octopus steals his plane, and he's like, oh, hey, it's this foreign dignitary. And here's, here's, here's where there's a miscommunication between me and 1960 whenever this happened. I didn't know that he was supposed to be, like, a bad guy. Um, I assumed it was just, like, oh, it's a famous foreign dignitary, like, something like that. Like, it's, like, a whole issue before I'm, like, oh, he's, like, an evil dictator guy. Not evil. He's, he's, he's a dictator and people don't like him. Oh. If I when it came out, I'm sure I would have been like, oh, well, he's obviously a stand-in for, stand for this person. Yeah. yeah, it'd be like if Vladimir Putin got, got kidnapped. Yeah. Um, or like... Yeah, it's, it's, like, it's like House Luton. of Cards stand-in for Putin, like, God, my, my, you just know his name, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but what's really fun is, so Dr. Octopus kidnaps his planet's foreign dignitary, and he's like, he's like, if you don't, 
uh, if you don't give me like a million dollars, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna crash this plane. It's gonna cause a whole huge international incident. And it's all these pictures. They're like, don't give him money. Just let him kill him. He's 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 a dictator. Just let him die. Who cares? Um, and then uh, and like he's Captain Stacy is in these issues. But not any more, I would assume, than any of the previous, than, like, any other issue. Like, he's just a presence. It doesn't feel like we're building to anything with him. Um, and we're, that's not, we're not finally getting some character work done that we want to get done so that we have nothing left to say about him. Yeah, no. Uh, like, it, I, I think it wants, you, it wants it to blindside you, which I guess that's fine. Sure. There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Um, Dr. Octopus is delightfully that fun. That was harder to do when I had a trade that was called The Death of Captain Stacy. Yeah, yeah. It's unfortunate. Yeah. Um, but uh, uh, Doctor Octopus is, is, is like is like really delightfully fun because he's just like I don't know running around and, like doing things. And then there's this big plane explosion at the end of eighty eight, and it's like, where is is Doctor Octopus cruelly dead? And the next issue opens with Spider-Man swinging around, going, saying to himself, not thinking, saying to himself, uh, see, see, he does that. He yep. says things out loud he shouldn't yep, say. Go yep. ahead. He's, he's, he's like, he's like, it's still hard to believe that Dr. Octopus is really dead, but I saw the plane crash with my own eyes. And the issue title right above him is Doc Ock Lives! <laughs> and I think that's hilarious. It's really um, funny. We didn't talk about this in the other issues we, we reviewed, the drug issues, but there's a, there's a point in that really early on where, Ian, again, not a thought balloon, but in a dialogue balloon, he's like, oh man, Green Goblin is the only person, or the only man alive who knows who I am. Why are you saying that out loud? Sometimes it's like... Did, did, you just, did, did you just write the balloon wrong? Should it have been a thought balloon? But sometimes it it's like, it's like, it's like Stan Lee forgets that there are thought balloons. Like... He's like, it's like these are what these look like, right? Panel. Yeah. He did on purpose. No, he's in the same panel. The rest of what he said was in his head. Yeah. Um. So, so like this whole second, this whole middle issue of the Death of Gwen Stacy trilogy is just Spider-Man fighting Doc Ock. It's really fun. Like, I mean, I guess it's not entirely, but like, it's a lot of Spider-Man fighting Doc Ock, and it's really fun. And then the next issue is just Spider-Man fighting Doc Ock, it's really and funny. then and then and that's really fun. And then uh, Captain Stacy dies, uh, and like that's <laughs> what happens. Also. Peter now I want to go back to my review and see if I try to analyze any of that. <laughs> well, okay, okay. So there is a little bit more going on. Um, so Peter, Peter's friends want him to come to a protest against pollution. And Peter's like, no, man, like, I'm totally with you, but, like, I got other things to do because he's got to go fight Dr. Octopus. And they're like, sure. man, you're not really with it. You're not with the cause. I don't know about you, Peter Parker. And he's like, man, you're no Trini Kwan. And there's this great thing where, like, Peter Parker is, like, validating himself to himself, where he's, like, as he's fighting Doc Ock, he's like, boy, I really wish I could be there and protest pollution. That's a bum rap. Like, it's awful. Like, I don't like pollution anymore than the next guy, but anyone can go pick at pollution. Only I can be here fighting Dr. Octopus. I think that's more immediately important. And, like, he has to convince himself that this is okay. Um, no, it's just, they're really fun and makes me want to go... Just kind of go visit the Lee Ramita era. Yeah. Because I'm like, oh yes, I because I. And it's it, that's also bold and colorful. And I don't, I don't dislike the Lee Ramita era, but like I always think like I don't know, Ditko and Spider Man. Like like, I know I know Lee and Ramita is as important and probably moving forward more important. Like everyone's doing Lee Ramita Spider Man. People aren't actually doing Ditko Spider Man. Yeah, at least more uh, influential. Yeah, yeah. Um, but like I, I like the Ditko stuff. Um, but like, it's fun. It's poppy, and like, um, it's it it's so smooth. Like, like I think a Stan Lee is like is like okay. I need to take like twenty minutes to like forty five minutes to read this one issue. They read like that. They're real when, fast when they're and clear. fun. And yeah, yeah. Um, no, I really, I really, I really, really enjoyed reading those three, and makes me want to go read the the Lee Romita stuff. So you're saying, and this is this is gonna sound like I'm dissing Stan Lee, but you're saying that like that that's quintessential like almost disposable comic book stuff, where like you might get something out of it, but like that's what comics that should read quick and then you go do something else, but like maybe you remember them, but like that that that's what like like a, like a really good superhero comic should read like. Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I I think so. I think I think the difference between when I say disposable, I just mean like you're supposed to be be able to read it quick and go do something else. Yeah, right? I think so. Um, um, 
I I think the difference between the Ditko era of Spider-Man's, at least where he is at this point. Now, you can also say it's just laziness, he doesn't care as much. Like, he's been doing this for like a hundred issues, like, you know? But it feels like he learned how to trust his art, uh, his artist, and trust the art. That he doesn't have to, every panel, explain you what's happening on the panel. Like, it really looks like he got really comfortable, and like, and maybe it's just a better like, working relationship with Ramita, and he trusted Ramita's art better. Because um, Ramita does a lot of, like, splash pages, and like, pages where there's like, four panels. Like, Ditko's all about that nine panel grid. Yeah. Um, so, like, maybe he's uh, maybe he's just more confident in Ramita as an artist. Um, but, uh, no, I, 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 I really, I was, it, was all, it was almost like rediscovering comics a little bit, where I was just like, oh, yeah, this is what it's supposed to be like. It's supposed to be fun, and, yeah. And, yeah. Um, and like, you know, it's nice emotional weight. Uh, and, and I kind of like that the, 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 the death kind of comes out of nowhere. I'm like, this is what superhero comics are supposed to be. It's supposed to be fun, and then occasionally there's something big dramatic that happens. Yeah, exactly. This is, this is what superhero comics are. This is what they're supposed well, to be. Well, and, and that's why I said disposable, because if you think you're just like, you know, just reading the thing for fun and you're not even really thinking about it. You're just like, yeah. oh, that's that's a that's a fun fight. It's a, you know, there's some dynamic action. It's like, oh crap! And then a like a like a real weighty major thing happens. Yeah. It's like you never expect that. Yeah. Yeah. No. I yeah. I I, I really really enjoyed reading them. Um, I don't know how it's collected in trade because I imagine it's not just those three issues. It's probably like a couple before or a couple after because three is weird for a trade. Yeah. But yeah, no, I think they're I think they're really good. Or maybe they just padded it with something else. With that's like, usually what they maybe do. Maybe they like, the origin and they get because like the Death One Stacy is two issues, but it's a whole trade. So like, what else? Like, they, they probably just put the issues been... before it and after, right? Like, just to make it. I a don't whole... think it did that. It probably just went back to like some random. Like, Crazy Scroll or... Wars like that. Like it's like that? three issues and like the, but the trade. But is, it sounds like, important, issues. so we got to yeah, make a trade yeah. out of it. Well, it is important. It's just they didn't use to write them for the trades. Yeah, but you know, whatever. Uh, so... You used to write them for the comic book. So the last thing I'm going to talk about is a thing that's not like that at all. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm going to talk... It's not, it's not about, it's not about what you love about superhero comics and, like, what superhero comics should be? Well, not, like, you know, like, as a kid reading superhero comics, because... It may feel would, like a kid again. I guess that's the obvious yeah, way to go exactly, with exactly, yeah. Th because this would freak children out and give them nightmares. Uh, I'm going to talk about the first arc in Grant Morrison's Doom Patrol. And everybody bear with me because I read this a couple weeks ago. And I wish I had taken the time to sit down and reread this because... Um, well, you had to read Fugitive. At some point, I would like to... Yes. Yeah, at some point, Fugitive. I would like to sit down and read all of this uh, run and talk about it on the whole. Because mm. I'm sure I, I there's... I mean... Without a doubt, there's some really interesting analysis to be had on this. Like, like I, I would like to write about this stuff, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. um, I never... I think there might be a book about it. ...thought I would care about Doom Patrol. I instantly... I don't, I don't want to say fall in love with, because I don't know that it's exactly my thing, but, mm -hmm. like, I was really intrigued and captivated by this. Um, Does it make you excited for the show? No. But that's just because I don't have a ton of faith in DC Universe right now. Like, I'll give it a shot, you know. Sure. But after Titans, I can't get super, you know, jazzed about it. Did you hear Brendan anyway. Fraser's voice every time Robot Man spoke? You know, I didn't. I didn't. Um, it was more give it time, of give it time. A raspy, like, kind of robotic thing. But, like, with, you know, he's mustering as much emotion as he can. But, like, he's having a hard time with it because he's, like, a robot guy now. Which is kind it's of like what that's all about. Wave. That's what I hear. I but, hear sound wave. But I'm imagining that when I hear Brendan Fraser voicing him, I also won't hear Brendan Fraser voices <laughs> him. I have voicing him. I, I assume it won't make any difference at all. I'd be like, auto tune to Brendan Fraser. This I uh, this series is uh, started in 1987. Uh, by the time Morrison is on it, this is um, volume two. I'm believe. sure we're into '88. Uh, and because uh, he starts in issue 19, I the reason I'm looking at my phone right now, by the way, is because uh, I didn't buy these, though I'd like to. Um, I probably will now. But uh, I read these on DC Universe. We're talking about DC Universe. They put those here, uh, which is smart, of course, because they're doing a show, and so they want people but to, be able put to the whole run. read about this a little bit. Um, not only did they not put the whole run, but they put the wrong part of the run. Uh, so they gave you one through 24, so you get the first six issues of Morrison. Of Morrison and All the, the 18 before. before. The why did they do that? I don't understand that. You'd think it would, if you were just going to do part of that run, it'd be 19 on. But it's not what they did. He goes through 30 something, 38, somewhere in there. So uh, he's on about half of that run. And uh, anyway, it's just weird, weird that they put it that way. So, like, immediately, I was like, oh, I want to read more of this. And there's, you know, two more issues. I'm assuming that's a whole story arc, and they didn't stop in the middle of a story arc, because that'd be weird. Um, but I'm pretty sure the first trade is six issues. I think Morrison does a really good job of... That's weird. Maybe I should have read those, too. I don't know. Um, but I... Uh, 
since they're there, maybe I should have just also read those. Oh, but, yeah. But I didn't. Uh, what was this, three issues? Four. Four. But, like, okay. story arc's done, you know, at the end of that. Yeah. Uh, so, anyway, I think Morrison does a really good job of uh, throwing you right in, and you don't necessarily have to read what came before. Like, he doesn't do... Because um, he's Morrison, and you know, obviously he's he's uh, pretty sophisticated and adept at what he does. So I mean, this is early Morrison. Sp- yeah, but uh, I, 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 <laughs> but like I couldn't tell it. I couldn't tell that. I mean, like, yeah, yeah, like yeah. it's really it's still Morrison at his best. I think. I mean, like, um, one thing that's really interesting about this. I'm getting ahead of myself, but you just made me think of this, and I want to say it while I'm while I'm thinking about it. This is the first thing I've read that is from Morrison. That's as close as it is. To what he did in Spawn, I uh, like. I just thought of that. This, like, like the story he tells here and the way he tells it, and how like surreal and and, and haunting and weird it is, and how it's dealing with um, like uh, metaphysical ideas and what is real and what isn't, and does that ultimately matter in the first place if you're perceiving it the way you are. Um, that's all the stuff he was doing in Spawn and in his couple issues in Spawn, and in the very in, in a very similar way, where like he he has the necroplasm thing that that he does in Spawn, except it's not coming from hell; it's coming from a fictitious book that comes to life. So, excuse me, and there it still is psychoplasm because Morrison's awesome and he tries to stick with psychoplasm, and then we get away from psychoplasm immediately after that. But I digress. Um, but in Morrison's uh, Spawn stuff, and he should have stayed on the book forever more. He should still be writing it. Um, well, what well, now sounds like his Spawn was just was just him like retreading this. Yeah, that's exactly what it reads like. But it, it made a lot of sense. It was a good place to go back to. Um, but no, it, it is it is weird going back to this and being like, wait a minute, you did this later <laughs> with Spawn. You got this weird city that's really amorphous and confusing and super creepy, and you're like. Uh, messing with reality and people go there and they lose their minds and they get all funky weird and you get all surreal surreal imagery and yeah it's the same thing you did with this with psychoplasm except this time again it comes from a fictitious book that is this is so weird so it's Morrison so of course I had to say weird um, it's 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 about uh, <laughs> these people that uh, somehow or rather make a uh, fictitious book come to life that was in itself a metafiction that was about a paradox and then it creates a paradox. So the book is about a thing that is uh, fictional happening in reality and then that comes into the reality of the fiction I'm reading and then uh, and, and then they bring forth the Scissor Men, who are absolutely horrifying, and they say all these nonsensical, non sequitur things that don't make sense. But probably, if you like really look at it really hard, and if you're in Grant Morrison's brain, they probably all mean something. Mm-hmm. Uh, they say really weird things. But um, first, you have the Scissor Men, and then you have like reality itself shifting and changing, and crazy things happening. Like there's there's like. There's like these simple, uh, right? There's like these pyramids in front of a building that start like randomly floating. There's people that like I don't I don't know if anybody like turns inside out, but things like that, right? Mm. Uh, and a whole bunch of just like really horrifying, bizarre imagery. At the same time as our main characters uh, are all having weird, horrifying, seemingly unreal things happening to them that are all actually real. And again, it's all about um, it's all about perception and what is real and what is not, and like kind of the stranger than fiction idea, which is fun because it's all weird and impossible, but within the reality of the comics, you have all these things that are real that are stranger than fiction and are just as weird or more weird than the things that are coming out of this book, which is kind of a cool idea. And in some ways it feels like even a precursor to um, to multiversity, Except he doesn't go as far as to bring me into it yet. So like you have, uh, you you have like a second, third wall break, but you don't have that fourth wall break yet, right? So like it's you, this is about a metafiction inside of the fiction you're reading, but it doesn't get to us yet, you know. And uh, that's the kind of stuff he's gonna start doing down the line a lot. It's like he's he's uh, I don't even want to say testing the waters. It's like he's just it's levels, you know. He's leveling to that. Eventually he'll get there and do that kind of well, thing. Well, I mean, he's writing. It's all about uh, He's writing Animal Man at the same time. Animal Man climax is with Animal Man coming to talk to Grant Morrison. Yeah, he said that, and I was kind of expecting something like that to happen in this, but it doesn't. Um, I always like that the Scissor Men scissors are like ridiculously large. Like, yeah, like huge. I would imagine them to be like, like they're like people sized scissors. Yep. Uh, but yeah, it's um, it's it's all about like I said, paradox and. Uh, it's about the metaphysical uh, uh, notion of like uh, 
how come there is and we keep saying this all through all through the the, 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 the issues like how how is it that there is something instead of nothing and like we've all had that thought a lot right mm -hmm. where, where it's like because you know you have the chicken and the egg thing and you have the um, like like uh, does does reality does it make sense that there is uh, even a reality at all because we can't figure out like where we all started from and like doesn't uh, you know that doesn't the universe like like seem too complex to have just happened? So then, like like doesn't that mean that you would need a creator? But then, who created the creator and all of that? And the so energy like, can't be created; it can only, it can only be uh, was it? Uh, it can't be destroyed. Yeah, but I thought it, it can't be. It can't be. It can't be created, can't be created or destroyed. Right. Yeah. yeah. You can only be changed. So so yeah. where did it come from? Yeah. So where does it come yeah. from? And I. Uh, he uses that as a great explanation for why... I haven't talked about the characters of the book yet. Um, he uses that as a great explanation for why uh, you could have something like... And there's a magic component to it, but like, 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 yeah, you could have something like um, non-real things in a book suddenly come to life, because like, how did it happen in the first place? So like, how is that any more out there mm. than reality as we have it, right? Mm. And... The way uh, Robot Man at the end of this, uh, I think it's Robot Man, talks uh, the, the, these uh, creatures into not existing anymore, going away, is uh, because there's this whole uh, there's this whole discussion about how they exist but they don't exist. Like again, like, it's a paradox. So it doesn't make sense that they exist, but clearly they're there and they're affecting people and they're messing up everybody. And at the end, everything goes back to normal. But for a while, it's just absolutely horrifying. And one of my favorite things, issue three opens with. Uh, oh man, I forget. I forget how exactly it was worded. I'm just gonna find it really fast because um, it's the best, and I don't want to mess it up. Uh, it opens in. Let me, let me, let me, let me find it. Let me find it. No, hold on. That's the last. That's the last issue. Everybody, just give me one second because I gotta find this. See, this is why, kids, when you're reviewing things, you should have the actual book, and not be reading on your phone. Um, but it opens up in Kansas City, like where we are right now. It opens up in Kansas City, and it's got, so like, so like this, the city's all messed up, and there's like these, I didn't know how to, how to describe them, these like creepy, like bone marrow, like legs and feet, right? Mm. And it's like, and then it goes, and as for Kansas City, I was like, oh, okay. As for Kansas City, Kansas City was a nightmare. <laughs> That's my favorite part. I took this to my wife in bed. She's about to go to sleep. I was like, you've got to see this. The Kansas City's a nightmare. Um, that's where we are right now. Anyway, I thought that was really funny. You never see Kansas City in the comics. So that, was, that, that was great. So the rest of this this, this takes place in Kansas City. It's great. Um, and anyway, so... Uh, but, 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 the, but the nightmare is Kansas City. A nightmare is Kansas City. And then at the end, but it all goes back to normal. Is it Kansas City, Kansas or Kansas City, Missouri? Well, I don't know. It never says. It never says that. Because, I mean, that already is nonsense. Like, like that fits perfectly with what you're saying. <laughs> well, uh, you could tell that it looked like it was downtown or power and light district and that would make it Missouri like mm. like like Kansas like the Kansas side doesn't have metropolis it's a metropolis esque it's you know, a, structures it's, 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 it's a paradox <laughs> and, and, and yeah, it, Kansas, it, it, yeah. It, it, it's intentionally obviously it's Kansas City Missouri because I didn't that's think that. any sense. You, you read this just now and you've got a better read on it than I do so anyway um but yeah, but I remember when I was like 17 robot man at the end of this I uh, like like talks the uh, the non-real things into going away uh, by getting the there's these two priests and like one is a liar and one is apparently not a liar and the liar one is like uh if it's like i am a liar and uh oh, I, there is two of them there's two of them i okay. am a liar and i do not know um why uh there is something instead of nothing and uh he he like he, he like logics his way out of this uh where it's like uh, he he gets he gets the liar one to say the opposite of what he means, and the idea ends up if I can remember this right, the idea ends up being that like, uh, if you're a liar and you say that there is, uh, that there is something instead of nothing, you mean the inverse of that, and so you don't exist because there actually is nothing instead of something, and you you you're you're a liar and you said the opposite thing, and so then they all go away. Sure. And yeah, it's great. Simple, right? It's just the most Morrison thing ever. It's it's wonderful. Like everything I've, all the crazy Morrison stuff I've read, I feel like like this is the beginning of that. Like no, it absolutely is. I think. 
I don't know if you did anything before that, but it feels like the impetus. I'm of not sure if Arkham Asylum predates that or not. But this is this is really early in his career. The Doom Patrol itself has broken up and gets back together at the end of this with kind of a new cast of characters. Um, I'm I don't know how many of them were there before because I didn't read all the stuff before it. Um, Could you imagine have, like, being the main like, guy who started it? And I don't remember his name, but he's a guy in a wheelchair like Professor X, but he's got a beard. And, yeah. Um, he seems a little more. Professor like, X has no hair. He has all hair. Right. But I don't know anything about him. But what are you, what are you uh, Could you imagine being like a like a kid or even like 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 a, like a preteen or teenager in like the eighties? And like you're you're going around, you're reading your superhero <laughs> comics, right? You're reading you're reading your Claremonts, you're reading your your your, your whatever's, right? Yeah, yeah. Right? You're reading your Peter David Hulk, and and you're also reading Doom Patrol because it's kind of like the X Men. I and it's the eighties, so you're reading X Men, right? Yeah, this is yeah. kind of like the X Men. And all of a sudden, in issue eighteen, um, it's <laughs> just something that yeah, nineteen, but yeah, and, and, and all of a sudden, issue nineteen. Yeah, so like you have like the brain breaking stuff where you just like mind freaks, like whoa! But you know who Grant Morrison is, like you know what the Doom Patrol's rep, like you're going yeah, into it ready for it. But also, you probably wouldn't expect how freaking horrifying it is. Like just imagery that freaks me out now is it's chilling to the bone. Um, there are the cast of characters are really interesting. You have Robot Man who just recently was a person who was who, whose uh, consciousness is put into a robot, and we deal a lot with. Um, and he's just, he's complaining and whining constantly, but it's understandable because of what just happened to him, and, and he thinks there's, like, no hope for him to live a normal life, of course, and, and, uh, Morrison's dealing with that kind of age-old science fiction idea of, um, that identity thing of, you know, how much of, you, or, of your humanity is tied to your physical body, and if you're in a robot body and you can no longer feel and touch the way you used to, do you start to lose your humanity, so we're dealing with that whole thing? Um, and then we have, uh, kind of like we do a lot with Cyborg now, you know, we're dealing with that stuff, and then you have, um, a, you, you have, like, a, a man and a woman simultaneously, uh, that character's really interesting, where, like, it was a man, but now it's not, and, and, the, and the whole way through they keep, like, calling him a man, and, like, they don't know what to call him, and, like, that's that's really confusing, and uh, he's got like what is that Mr. Negative? He's got like he's got uh, the bandages, bandages he, he all looks over. Like him. He looks man. like the Invisible Man, yeah. Uh, and that's really interesting. And then you have uh, the girl who has uh, different personalities, and every time she switches, she has a different superpower. So she's like Resurrection Man before Resurrection Man, um, except she it's not like every time you die. She's kind of split. like the split guy if every single one of those personalities has a superpower. Yeah, it's a lot like that. Yeah, yeah, uh, and. I like her a lot because uh, she keeps, again, it's all about identity. Everybody keeps, and, and so like, the, the way those characters are kind of uh, compared to the situation and are almost personifications of the situation, is it, it, it's, it's like, what is real on like a personal, uh, like, existential level? You know what I mean? There's like, there's what you can see, and then there's like what there's there, what there is, what there seems to be, in, in like in like uh, in like how these people feel about themselves. And so you still have the the you have like the questions about reality almost like personified in this like these existential ideas. It's Morrison, um, and so I uh, and so with her, um, everybody is. Uh, like the, as I'm talking about this, I'm, I'm, I'm realizing there's like these really interesting, clear parallels, and there's obvious there's the, this obvious theme going through all these characters, which is everybody looks at Robot Man as a robot, but he's not he's not just a robot, and everybody looks at Mr. Negative as a man, but he's not just a man, and everybody looks at uh, this woman with different personalities as this one woman, but she's all these different people, and they keep trying to call her by her name, but she's not. Every time she's a different person, she's like, "That's not who I am. Stop calling me that." And so it's it's all about identity and perception. Um, I really want to read more of it because I'm really curious to see where all that goes. And so these people, um, and they is there a fourth with, one? Is there another person that I'm not even remembering? Um, those are the three main those characters three that I show remember. up a lot that I remember. Um, yeah, I think that's it. That, that that's them. And then um, and as for Kansas City, and then at the end, uh, the reason they put the Doom Patrol back together is because they say. If things like this happen again, we have to be around because such weird stuff has happened to us, we're prepared for it. You know, we can, like, help these people through it because we're walking absurdities and weirdness. And, uh, like, like we didn't lose our minds going through this situation. And if we can handle this, we can handle anything. And uh, that's how they put the team together. Like, that's that's the arc that, that makes the team decide to come together. Is the weirdest thing imaginable happens. And I'm sure, it gets, I'm sure it gets weird because it's Morrison. But anyway, um, 
It's great. Well, there is I a, really, there really is a painting that eats cities. Is there? Sounds like a thing he would do. Uh, yeah, yeah, that, that's what the Dada, the Dada is. And there's also that character that showed up in New 52 for a little bit as part of the Teen Titans. That's a, it's a superhero boy that is a street. That's he amazing. He's a street. He's a street. Is he being a street? He's being a street. <laughs> anyway, so uh, that's all I've got to say about that. Um, I, you know what? I totally forgot to even mention the person who who, who requested that, didn't I? Um, I don't think you mentioned it for Fugitive either. No, I talked about Ian. Um, oh, with that, okay. but, but yeah, but yeah, Cody uh, requested that. Thank you, Cody. I really appreciate that, um, and I'm glad that I finally read some of that, and I want to continue on and uh, do more of that. They, and they recently released that, night in, I think, three nice trades. Am I turning into a Morrison guy? Is this happening? I always said that that probably wouldn't happen with me because, like, he tends to be even a little bit too out there for me. But then I really liked a lot of stuff I read with Multiversity. Sometimes I didn't know what I was looking at, and then like Klaus has become one of my favorite favorite things. And like, am I turning into a Morrison guy? Is this happening? It depends on. I I I I I think that you could be turning into a certain side Fans of Morrison. Of certain thing. Yeah, yeah. Okay. those are two different sides, though. Klaus and this? Well, yes. Those yes. are representative of the well, two sides of Morrison. Well, well, well I was, I was. Uh, and well, diversity is yeah, that. I guess, I guess, right. And, and Just League and the X Men are kind of like that. Too. Yeah. X Men's not as weird as that, but it's weirder than you'd think it would be. Yeah, and then like I know his Batman gets kind of weird, but not like that. Not like that. I, I've always been treated Seven Soldiers of Victory. I'm interested in that. I don't know. I just feel like I'm adjusting to it to some degree. At some point, we have to do his Just League run. Or not his run, like, like I want you to try that. Because okay. it's okay. It's just, like, good, pure superhero comics. Which is not what you expect from him. No, not at all. Um, and I need to find... It's like Klaus, but that's a Just League book. I mean, for years I've said I'm going to finally review R R.I.P. I started it one time and never got never got finished with it. I mean, so, you have to read the run around it. Oh, no, I know that. Yeah. I know that. But Just jump um, into R.I.P. Wait, we crazy? Well, I was That's the primo stuff. That's not, what, that's not what I was doing. I just mean, like, you know, more since yeah, run. Yeah. But... That will take a long time, and I know right now you and I are reviewing a lot of other things, but that doesn't need to happen at some point. Yes. Um, anyway, thanks a lot for watching, folks. I know this was a longer vault, and we just did three vaults, uh, but uh, we needed to talk about several things. We're pole vaulting. Yes, we are, and now let's pole vault uh, past the vault and get to uh, how we felt about it. We're going to talk about a number of movies. Uh, I don't know if this is going to have to be one video or two, so bear with us. Uh, Eric and I have a couple things we both watched. I have a bunch of requests. There's things I just got to blow through, so um, not to diminish any of the requests. I just have a bunch of things I, I watched for this, and uh, I, we will talk about them here in just a little bit. So thanks a lot for watching, folks. Be sure to appreciate it, and we will see you again in just a little bit. If you're watching this in the playlist, keep it going, and otherwise, thanks a lot for clicking on this video. I am Captain Logan. And I'm Eric. See you later, folks.